All right, folks, welcome to Real Progressives. My name is Steve Grumbine. Tonight, this is a very, very special night for me, as many of my guests are come out here and just really fill me completely up with, with knowledge and excitement about the possibilities that our collective movements can bring about, you know, in our culture, in our society, in our country, and around the world. Tonight is no different. Tonight, I have the pleasure of bringing Asa Khalif from Black Lives Matter Philadelphia onto the show. But before I bring him out here, I want to tell you something. I got to meet this gentleman in Washington, D.C. at Occupy Inauguration. At Occupy Inauguration, Asa was leading the charge. He was right out there in front. And I got to walk with him probably for about 15 minutes. I filmed him a lot. And I got to hear him and I got to chat with him. I got to know him just a little bit, just a little teeny bit. But our coalition was so big, I just kept moving through. And I've been trying to hook back and forth with Asa since Occupy Inauguration. Tonight, the stars align, our schedules aligned, and we were able to make this thing happen. So without further ado, let me bring on my guest, Asa Khalif. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. Uh, it's definitely a, a honor and a pleasure. I know we've been working um, t- uh, tirelessly to try to get this interview together. Um, but again, the stars are aligned. I just wanted to, um, before we go into everything, I just want to make a quick uh, correction. And it's not on your part. Um, it kind of gets confused at times, but I am not with the uh Black Lives Matter Philly chapter. I am a Black Lives Matter activist in the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, not the network. And the uh, group that I'm um, a part of is the Coalition for Black Lives. So I just wanted to make that um, correction. But I am a national organizer in the Black Lives Matter movement. Excellent. Thank you so much for clarifying that. So I I, I want to tell you, you know, we, we all have these moments and during the speaking at Malcolm X Park, it was very exciting just yes. seeing everybody being together. But for me, the real power came walking next to you in the march from there into the district. You know, into yes. you, you were on fire, man. And <laughs> you know, I, I'm serious. I there was at least, uh, and this is kind of how I'm wired, which is kind of weird considering how big I am. But I'm wired for tears, man. I'm watching you, and I just wanted to put my fist in the air and say, things are changing, man. Things are going to happen. You're, you've got a great, great presence, man. I'm, I'm blown away. Thank you so much, Stephen. But I, I give all the praise and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he gives me the courage to get out there and to inspire and um, to allow my guard to be down, you know, what you feel and what you see is energy. And it comes not only just um, from me, it, it connects with the people. And that crowd uh, during that uh, inauguration um, march that we were a part of, uh, you felt the energy. You saw a, a coalition of people from all walks of life, you know, standing together um, and just feeding off each other's courage and positivity and that's what it you know that's what it takes that's what this um battle is all about you know it's about standing up um for justice and standing against injustice but yeah that was a powerful moment man i mean we had again we had our native american um brothers and sisters there we it was just it was just a wonderful moment uh very seldom that you actually have a chance to kind of just be present and that day, and I remember you, uh, and I, I said, I'm going to get him to raise his hand and his fist uh, before we get to the finish line. But, uh, I mean, it was just it was just incredible. You just had to be there. And it really showed um, when people come together uh, for change, we can really make, um, make huge movements in this um, fight for justice. Absolutely. So, Asa, obviously the Starbucks situation – you know, it's one instance, but yet it seems like it's all over the place. This isn't really one instance. This is a widespread um, issue, and and you had the opportunity to be front line and center. Tell us a little bit about what happened with Starbucks, and tell us how you guys handled it. 
Well, uh, it's now coming out that that particular Starbucks at 1801 um, Spruce Street in Rittenhouse Square, which is a affluent uh, neighborhood in Center City in Philadelphia. So that's usually where we call the bougie people live. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's it's always been a place for tourists, but it's never been a safe space for black and brown and poor people. And so it really didn't come to no surprise to me uh, when I heard and the reports came out that these two uh, black males uh, were targeted um, and racially profiled. And so the first thing we needed to do, uh, this event took place on Thursday last week. And so we needed to respond to it as quickly and as, as possible. You know, something like this could not just wait and, and for us to kind of wait for it to play itself out. So we needed a direct response. And not only, Steve, uh, not only was black and brown people outraged by that video, and clearly it was alarming, uh, but we had people, you know, again, from all walks of life who were outraged when they saw that video uh, and wanted to stand with us. And so I organized on Sunday, the very first March, and uh, protest uh, in front of the store. And uh, we also went inside the store because I thought it was extremely important that we secured that space again and make it safe visibly for black and brown people. Uh, we kept seeing over and over again the uh, video of, you know, the two men led out uh, by law enforcement. Uh, and you saw their vulnerability. You just felt helpless when you saw it. Uh, along with anger. So we needed to uh, make a statement. We needed to show visibly for uh, everyone who was watching. And we needed Starbucks to know that we have reclaimed that space outside as well as inside, that we were not going to allow racial uh, bias and racism to uh, make people of color afraid. And so I took Sage, which is a... Um, it's pretty much to cleanse uh, the space because the space was tainted. It was tainted with racism. It was tainted with fear. It was tainted with bias by law enforcement. And so, um, you know, black people are going to go back eventually. Some black people will go back once this blows over and this is handled properly back to Starbucks. I mean, I was a customer of Starbucks. I've had several meetings at Starbucks. I've had good experiences at Starbucks. I was fortunate. Um, but simply because I or certain other people had a good experience doesn't mean that racial bias did not exist as we saw. So I wanted... Um, to secure that space, and we did. It was the people, you know, the people united, not just black and brown people, the people stood together. Um, LGBT, trans people were there, uh, Native American people, Asian people were there, white people were there, the people. We came back to let Starbucks and any other corporation know that if you continue or if you ever show your uh, head in terms of racial profiling or show that uh, you're going to be boldly uh, racist, that the people, especially here in Philadelphia, will join together and shut you down. And that's exactly what we did. That is awesome. I mean, I watched some of the videos and footage I just kept thinking to myself, this guy never stops. I mean, <laughs> don't have time, a break, man. <laughs> you, 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 we couldn't do the the prior week be, or the last time we tried to hook up because you were busy doing a vigil for another young man who had gotten yes. gunned down. Stefan Stefan Clark, exactly. Talk, yes. Talk to us about Stefan a little bit. Well, this was a young man, a black uh, young man who was uh, shot. Uh, multiple times, I think over 20 times, in the backyard of his grandmother's home. Uh, he was unarmed. Police, uh, two police officers who were pursuing him uh, did not um, act, in my opinion, and based on some of the evidence that, that are now emerging, uh, in terms of protocol. Uh, there was no... Um, grace period. It was gun, 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 and, and the shots were fired. And then something that made us very alarmed, the people, uh, they turned their body cameras, uh, the muted, they muted, excuse me, their body cameras, the, so you couldn't hear the audio after the shooting. Uh, the, in, 
independent uh, autopsy that the family uh, had done showed that the young man was shot multiple times in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and these two officers, and then also when they are uh, called for backup, the officers sat there for minutes and watched this man die without even uh, trying to administer some sort of medical aid. You know, it, it just reaffirms, Stephen, what I say all the time when it comes to law enforcement. Black and brown bodies don't matter to them. And that's just the honest God truth. We cannot afford at this point uh, to ignore that. You know, it's very difficult to know that your taxpayer dollars and I, I work, I have a business. I pay a hell of a lot of taxes. I want to know that law enforcement uh, is there to protect me as, as well as well as my white counterparts. And unfortunately, um, with the history of black and brown bodies and law enforcement, it's just not so. Uh, you know, I have white friends. I have white people in my family. I love them. I, uh, you know, I respect them. They respect me. But we all have to be honest that if you're pulled over and I'm pulled over, the circumstances are going to be very much different. And, um, the first thing we can do in terms of changing is we have to acknowledge that. And uh, once we acknowledge it, then we can start having conversations for change. But we first have to acknowledge it. We cannot say, well, the police officers are all good cops. No, no, no. We're not talking about the, uh, the good cops that you are alluding to. We're talking about the bad apples. And when you're in law enforcement, you can't afford to be uh, bad apples in anything. It's like you can't afford to have a bad apple with a doctor. <laughs> you can't afford to have a bad apple, as Chris Rock said, with a pilot. Law yeah. enforcement have a license to kill. And because their responsibilities are so, you know, the stacks are so high and they have a lot of power, then, you know, they must be held accountable and held to a higher standard when they uh, violate um and go above and beyond what they sworn to do. Absolutely. You know, it, it's interesting because, you know, I hear you know, a lot of different things coming from Southern Maryland. You know, you were either black or you were white. We didn't have any other things there. It was a very interesting mix. Mm -hmm. Life was very different. Um, even back then, I mean, we all were grew up as friends. We all played ball together and everything. And as we got older, things changed. Yes. And, you know, as you as you go through these things, you start realizing everybody's got a different experience. Uh -huh. You know, it, it, it really. I don't know how to explain it other than to say that it's hard to know what someone else is going through unless you've been in their shoes, unless you've taken the time Absolutely. to listen, not just see what you think based on your own lens, but uh -huh. hear from their lens. And exactly for me, I, I guess, you know, I came from addiction. I came from, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, et cetera. And I definitely had a, a very, very different upbringing. So to speak. my mom and dad loved me to death, but I was busy just running, you know, I was, I was running the wrong crowd, running, doing the wrong things. Life just spiraled out of control until one night I got arrested. And this is the, this might've been the biggest light bulb moment of them all for me. I got arrested and I got arrested for having possession of marijuana and I had money. I had a good job. And so here I am with a, a an amount that for somebody with, money in a job isn't all that much pot. Right. But right. I'm in the jail cell with four young black kids. They might have mm -hmm. been, they might have been 18, 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they asked me point blank, they said, what are you in here for? And I said, I have possession of pot. I had, you know, paraphernalia. And they think I was trying to distribute. I said, but I wasn't. That was just my stash. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, they're, they're laughing at me, you know, and they're like, man, he go, we just had a joint, man. He goes, they, they're keeping us in here, too. They won't let us go because he says something about we don't have a job or something like that. So we're, you know, we, 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 we're no good or something like that. I was like, really? So I said, they go, Mr. Grumbine, come up and see the commissioner. So walking out of the cell, going up there. Commissioner goes, Mr. Grumbine, I see here that you are a senior manager at Bell Atlantic Verizon or whatever. And I was like, yes, sir. He goes, well, you don't appear to be a flight risk, and it appears that you have good college under your belt. 
And this was this was a black commissioner, mind you. He uh-huh. goes, I'm going to let you go. So I went back to the holding cell waiting for them to process my papers. Uh-huh. And these guys go, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? I said, they're letting me go. They're like, oh, man, that's good, man. You go go spend time with your family. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, what is wrong with this? And, I mean, there was no Black Lives Matter yet. This is pre-Black Lives Matter. Yeah, but yeah. It should have been happening uh, right there. It's it's crazy. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's – we can we can, we need another hour just to deal with the disparities in the justice system. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean we we may need two hours, Stephen, on that one. We can but, have I mean, one, man. <laughs> yeah, look, probably a lifetime. But I mean, it's it is what it is, and I think right now, uh, with this particular era of of time that we're in. Uh, folks are calling it for what it is. You know, at times we we were afraid to say racism. We were afraid to say, or just a certain group of people were saying racism and other people didn't want to accept that. But I think now we're, we're forced at this point and uh, to say and call a thing a thing and to have the difficult conversations. And I think, you know, people are outraged now. Something it's something about when something clicks, like you have a light bulb moment. When that light comes on, it's very difficult to go back into the darkness. <laughs> you know, if you see something, you feel compelled as a human being to say something at this point. And people are just tired of it. You know, they're saying we can't even get into the race part until we, you know, uh, people who are not uh, people of color say, look, you know, this is wrong. Absolutely. And and I'm going to call it out. I'm going to challenge it. No matter if it's at the dinner table, no matter if it's at my job, no matter if it's at the church, wherever it is, I'm going to speak out and call it. Because at the end of the day, right is right and wrong is wrong. And when you see wrong, it's your obligation to call it out. Amen. I, look, I want to talk to you. You know Michelle Alexander, great Great yes. legal mind, wonderful speaker, great mm-hmm. author, wrote the new Jim Crow laws. Yes. She fought against the legalization measures in Ohio based on the fact that they were going to grant access licenses to six wealthy white groups, basically, to suddenly capitalize on what they had been already capitalizing on putting black people in prison for. Now they were going to capitalize on selling it. And she said, hell no, not going to have it. And here we go. Right now, you've got no one other than John Boehner, of all people, who is now suddenly a part of of the big, you know, selling of pot. I mean, the guy is out there investing now in in these dispensaries. This is the ultimate hypocrisy. These people were more than willing to throw you in jail and throw away the key. Now they're going to make money off that. That's completely. Completely wrong. Completely well, wrong. Well, see, that's how well, that's how backwards this corrupt system is. Uh, it's it's never been about poor people or working class people. The system uh, is powerful, and it's about privileged people, powerful people, rich people. Never about us common folk people. <laughs> and so, if any way the government can make some money. To fill Uncle Sam's pockets, believe me, they're going to do it. They'll flip flop on you quicker than a, a pancake in Fridays <laughs> or somewhere. <laughs> All right. So, so let me ask you this question: You know, when it comes to protest and it comes to taking to the streets, you've obviously seen success at Starbucks. And we've seen successes throughout the United States when people come together and they join hands and they say enough's enough. And we've seen it over and over again. What are the real challenges that you face as an activist taking this stuff to the streets, not just organizing, but, you know, getting the message out? What what is the chief impediment to you being able to get people to see the truth? Through, their, through your eyes, through the lens of an African-American, through, through a black or brown person's view, how, what is your key challenge here? What, what do you find is the biggest stumbling block? I think the biggest stumbling block is for outside uh, 
instigators to try to muddy the waters of the message. And when I say as an, as an activist who have organized since I was 13 years old, um, the best thing to do when you have an a, a, a action, and that's what we call it, is to make sure you stay on point. There's going to be a lot of distractions coming from outside aggravators or agitators, excuse me, um, or the police, or, you know, just individuals who showed up who was not clear. Before you take to the streets, everyone must be on the same page. Anything that I organize, for instance, uh, for example, this Sunday, uh, last Sunday, when we did the Starbucks protest, it was labeled the People's Rally, and that was the hashtag. Because the goal was to have people from all walks of life to stand together and show this corporation and remind the city uh, that the people united will never be defeated. So we never um, got off message. There were uh, two or three instigators who tried to, you know, to uh, disrupt. But, you know, we were steadfast and unmovable when it came to our message. And the message was the people will not tolerate racial profiling. The people will not tolerate racism in this city. And everywhere and anytime it shows its ugly head, we're gonna chop it off. And so we were not intimidated by the police. We were not intimidated um, by the smooth talk of the CEOs who they planted there with a black face. We were not intimidated. You know, every time when they do wrong, they wanna bring a black person out there to calm the Negroes down, but it's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. We we shut that we shut that thing down real quick. You know, I respect the sister. God bless you. But the people have rose up, and there ain't no need to go start talking when the people come. You should have started talking before you hired that racist manager. <laughs> so we were very on point. But I would tell anybody first of all, first and foremost, organize from your heart. And let your passion, the people will come out because they see your passion and connect with it. Don't let anyone silence your voice. There's a lot of uh, voice silencers here in Philadelphia. You can, I take all the heat, but I am not going to go before some justice league to ask permission. Oh, oh you know, I'm not going to be Tina Turner asking Ike, could I sing? <laughs> you know, you're not going to help Ike. You want to help Ike? No, 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 no. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And that is to bring people together. And that is to fight for black and brown and poor people. And, you know, and that's what it is for me. And so I would tell anyone who's watching, you know, organize, organize from your heart. If it's pure, it will resonate with the people, but don't let anyone silence your voice. And we were not going to allow Starbucks to silence our voice. We needed to send a clear message that this will not happen again. And not only in your this particular store, in any of your stores, it won't happen. It will not happen again. And so they got the message. And, you know, I'm just glad that, you know, other activists came forward the next day and continued on with the pressure. But it was important for us, um, members of the Coalition for Black Lives, to step in front and not sit back and wait. You know, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, they're not coming to save us. Black Panther, if you want to go and start fighting against racism, you better put on a cape and go out there and fight it for yourself. And that's what we did. And we shut it down, too, on Sunday. Um, I, I couldn't be more proud of you. I, I, I really am just so impressed. I got to ask this question. This comes from someone who I used to deal with all the time, and, and she would all, often say, people don't want to hear from me because they don't want to hear from a, a angry black woman. And she would say it just like that because she was like, this is the, the, the stereotype that they try mm -hmm. and put on us. And they use that to mute our voice. They don't yes. want to hear it because we're just the angry black man or the angry black woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you see the way that they paint it. Not to, we, we call it the aesthetic, right? Because I'm fighting yeah. a different war for economic justice. And right. it, it, they work together. But the point is, is that they create what they call an aesthetic. And that's how we view things. And it's not just in the one simple area you're talking about. It's in everything. It's in the exactly. books you read. It's in the TV shows you watch. It's in the way that they do the pictures at work. It's in the way that you see the subway signs, whatever. Every single bit of this feeds a narrative and that aesthetic is how they paint the narrative 
And and I remember, you know, you see you see the hard look, you know, the angry look, that uh-huh. the angry look, and it's like they catch me, and just so you know how funny this is, they catch me in these faces where I'm like, you know, some face on 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 the uh, interviews, and they go, "There, freeze frame, there." It makes oh, you yeah. look like an asshole. Now let's go ahead and put this out there as a meme, or let's trash they- it. <laughs> It's oh, crazy that you spoke. It's crazy you spoke of memes because they turned me into a meme. I don't know if you saw it. No. <laughs> Even my, I had no idea until my nieces and nephews call, text me from their school. I thought something was wrong. They said, "Okay, Asia, you're a meme." And I'm sitting there saying, "What?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> they got me from everything. I, I cereal, cocoa pops, fruity pebbles. It was crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. But look, you know. Um, I, I wasn't stressing. Actually, I, I kind of enjoyed some of the memes. But the bottom line is, you know, it took action. It took um, courage to go and, and actually confront that. Um, you know, the memes is, is one thing. And you can laugh and joke about all that. But one thing is not uh, we cannot afford to joke about, and that's racial profiling and racism and discrimination. And I, not only that, um, Stephen... I wanted to also have those conversations to open up um, that poor people are also discriminated against at yes. Starbucks. I've seen that multiple times. I have bought uh, individuals who were, you know, down on their luck or just homeless, you know, but just wanted a cup of coffee and something to eat. And, and I purchased it and sat at the table with them. And I have seen them, you know, as soon as I get up and leave, they will come over to to force them to leave. And so, you know, if you're going to start talking about policies, you better make sure that when you're at the table, you include the poor because there, by the grace of God, go any of us. You know, Um, and so when we're talking about justice, we must include the poor. And I'm a huge advocate for poor, working poor people, homeless people, um, you know, because this system puts their foot on their necks all the time. So if we got a chance to have Starbucks against the rope before we knock them out, we better make sure we put include poor people in that conversation as well. Absolutely. You know, so I, I want to bring something up. I, you know, speaking with Derek Hamilton, not too terribly long ago, we touched on some of the economic disparities that are in existence right now, especially in the United States. Uh, and, and a lot of it is based in race and you can see it clearly in percentages it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that different groups have been severely marginalized by this American dream we are trying to live in. And it's become an American nightmare for many. And for me, myself, you know, I, I, I oftentimes talk about my own story to show people, to demonstrate to them, you know, behind me, I've got four degrees up here. I've got two master's degrees. I've got tons of certifications. I couldn't find work. Yes. And I had a ding, that marijuana arrest. It wouldn't, I, I had jobs rescinded because mm-hmm. of that background smear for that one arrest. Okay. Mm-hmm. That sh- just is such a small thing. And yet it wrecked my life. Now, Absolutely. In all fairness, I've got, you know, I'm white, I'm male, mm-hmm. I'm educated, I have a family that, cares about me and sticks by me that has helped me out of many a jam. And I had grass six feet tall. I had a car that was way underwater without reverse. I couldn't pay my trash bill. So my trash was sitting in a freaking pile in my yard. I was that guy. My teeth are rotting out of my mouth. You name it. All these problems going on. And I just kept thinking to myself, Oh my God, thank God I go to AA and NA meetings and stuff like that and get to hang around with people that are keeping it real and that actually are from different walks of life because I had privilege even in that circumstance and that privilege allowed me second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth chances that other people don't get a one shot. And that goes back to that arrest that night in that jail cell with Uh these young boys. We, We advocate here for a federal job guarantee. Martin Luther King pushed for it. It's now suddenly got a lot of backing. There's an incredible amount of uh, work being done by Professor Sandy Darity and, and William, Ham- uh, excuse me, Derek Hamilton, who was on Bernie Sanders economic justice uh, platform the other day. But also awesome. we've got people at Levy Institute, uh, you name it, all these folks are Ben Zager Institute. 
They are fighting tooth and nail, modern money network even, to get a federal job guarantee out there at a living wage with living benefits so that folks like, for example, in Flint, Michigan, that aren't being served by their local, they can leave. People in bad situations, yes. they can leave. Pick up and leave, man. Get out of here. And, and to me, that completely starts the, the, the process of healing generational poverty. It immediately er eradicates the lottery of birth because now you've got a shot right off the bat. If uh -huh. the man fires you, it's okay. You're not going to lose your health insurance. You're not going to lose your dental, all these things. What about economic justice do you see is the vital component that people need to understand in terms of dealing with race relations and being able to understand that, you know, you oftentimes hear people that don't take the time to ask, well, look at this and look at that. And, you know, why is this and why is that? And they always ask these, what I consider to be dumb questions that they're trying to lead you to an answer because their racist ass wants to present something to you, but they don't want to say it. They're trying to make a point, but their point is founded in bad thinking. Their point is founded in bullshit. It's founded Absolutely. in something that has nothing to do. I mean, if, if I was brown, I would not be sitting here today talking to you. I'd be dead because I mean, of the, things. Yeah, I, I, we have to, again, going back to calling the thing a thing, you know, you being a white male uh, in America, the hardship that you talked about, imagine being a person of color. You, you know, the privilege... You know, it may not be no fault of your own, but it is what it is. The privilege of white males and uh, white people in America uh, gives them the, the opportunity to have second, third, fourth, fifth chances, you know, and even, you know, <laughs> and it ends further on. Um, the reality is black and brown people are can't afford that. You know, uh, if you get a felony charge, you're pretty done. You know, unless you there is some sort of blessing, a miracle or someone that, you know, that can get you involved or you have a, a, a vision to start your own business and get help from that way. I mean, the system is designed to keep you in bondage. And so, you know, there's a reason why when they ask you, have you ever been convicted of a felony? <laughs> that's just not because of accident. That's, you know, that's just designed to cut you off. So you have to now report back to your probation officer, well, I haven't found a job, and they're looking at you and saying, well, why can't you find a job? Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then you want to put in the, the education piece. You know, it all it's all designed to keep you from uh, achieving and it is designed to keep the uh, I call it the matrix design prison or school the prison pipe uh -oh. Uh -oh. I think we might be having oh, there we go. someone, quote unquote, that they consider trailer trash to move to Wall Street, even though if you gave them opportunities, if you gave them proper education, they can move from their circumstances into, quote unquote, the American dream, which I call it just American fantasy, because <laughs> it's a nightmare for anyone that's black and brown and poor or working poor. If you're not a part of the one percent, you're not, you know, you're not in that whole system of make-believe if you will if you will um but we you know we have to deal with everything not just only on how we're policing or how we're policed we have to deal with the education piece we have to deal with job disparities we have to deal with poverty i mean it's all designed and i think what trump has awakened everyone now to you know to realize that it's our responsibility now to build these coalitions amongst ourselves and stop the squabbling. We cannot afford at this point any longer to continue to let petty biases stop us. We have to unite as people at this point to deal with the issues. And and I even say that within our community, you know, because there can be division within our community as well. You know, some you have some black conservatives, you know, which <laughs> I really didn't have time 
or the patience to deal with a black conservative <laughs> because I kept looking at him saying, I think you need some mental health issues, but or help. But I think even now, regardless of what party that you're affiliated with as black and brown people, you realize that when you walk into a room, they see the skin that you're in and not necessarily the party that you're affiliated with. And so people are waking up now and realizing that, you know, it's going to be, it's going to take us to uh, protect one another in our communities, to educate one another in our communities. We cannot depend no longer on the government. The government never had the best interest for black and brown and poor people. It was always there to keep us you know, just a little bit wanting more. But I think we're now taking the initiative. We're feeding. We have a homeless um we have a homeless program where we actually um, are working with certain groups that I see in the communities now that are providing housing, um, you know, food. You know, you, you pretty much know on the block in your neighborhood who, who has, is running through, you know, hard times, you know, fix a food basket. You know, a thing we're, we're taking care of each other at this point now. And so and that's bringing people together. And that's so that's a good thing if you. If you can find any good thing that comes out of Trump <laughs> getting elected is forcing people now to put aside their petty differences and really unite to take care of one another. And so I, I'm happy for that. I see that in the neighborhoods. I see that outside the neighborhoods. I go to certain areas, certain rallies, and you, you see the faces of people um, standing together, who in, who are not afraid to say Black Lives Matter, who are not afraid to stand up against anti-Semitism, uh, who's not afraid to stand up for trans rights, who are not afraid to uh, challenge and and um, and you know uh, condemn individuals who are you know anti-gay. Uh, so you know it's bringing people together. And again, I cannot stress how important it is at this point. The government never, it, it never was designed to bring people together. It was always designed to separate us. And so we're hip to the game now. So now that we're hip, we better unite and start challenging and tearing down these systems that are oppressing us. Let, let me ask you a question. So going back to the Black Panthers, they really did take care of their community. Am I frozen? They, what's that? No, you're good. Okay. Did I get frozen? Okay. You're good. Can you hear me? I think we're... Can you hear me okay? All right. Let's see. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I think we've got having some technical let's problems see. here, folks. So I'm going to give him a chance to get the thing back. <clears throat> In the meantime, I want to just say that if, if we're not able to get Asa back uh, technically here, that this has been one of my favorite interviews so far. I mean, there's just so few people that actually get out there and do what they have to do. Um, and I just appreciate so much of what's going on. I think on we're basically. frozen. Let me see. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can bring Asa back into the program, see if I can get him out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Are we still frozen? No, Steven? we're good, man. We're good. Okay, let me see. All right. All right, folks. Well, look, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to end up. Oh, I think he's going to try and come back on here in a second. So I'll just keep the keep the fire burning while he tries to come back on. But in any event, I I hold on. Here he comes. Here we go. <laughs> Do you See, hear me okay? I can hear you. When you start talking about the government, they want to shut you down. I keep trying to tell people it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> uh, I was trying to talk about the Panthers and how they were so successful at feeding people and really yes. taking care of their communities. Unfortunately, the propaganda machine made them out to be things they weren't. But yes. what we're seeing now is, I don't know if it's fair to call it a resurgence, but it's it, it's the same concept on many levels of really, truly taking care of the communities they're in. And, you know, I think that that unity is, is very, very important. And when you don't have your local governments and your state governments and your federal government taking care of you, and what I mean by taking care of you is being part of you, being of you, 
you know, having your best interest at heart. Somebody's got to take it into their own hands and make sure that the people are taken care of. And it sounds to me like that's what you guys are doing. Yes, um, we we've started. Um, we've every Saturday we feed the homeless, and we've done it for about a year now uh, in different neighborhoods. Uh, we started out as you know uh, providing for the homeless, but in certain neighborhoods now here in the city, uh, we have working poor families or working families who need needed food. And we didn't realize that it was that serious. Uh, and so we have, you know, there, we included them as well. I mean, the issue again is, you know, like you said, you gave the example of the Black Panthers, you know, they started, it was the 10 point plan also included making sure that they eradicated poverty in their communities. And so, again, it is our responsibility. Yes, it's our responsibility as people to make sure that, you know, our neighborhoods um, are taken care of. I'm not saying feed the whole neighborhood. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about paying people's rent so everybody can just sit around. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, you know, uh, you know, in the neighborhood where uh, the help need is needed. Um, someone may have lost their mate their spouse, someone may have lost their job, someone may have had health issues. You know, it's not uh, asking very much to show some compassion and organize and, and you know, to help someone um, and help your neighbors. I think is the, is the right thing to do. I think is the godly thing to do. I think um, it's our responsibility to help one another. It's as simple as that. The system has designed us to look at their self and you see where that has gotten us nowhere. So, right. you know, the only way we can truly start to make change is when we um, decide not to take off our humanity. So I, I want to ask you like as for the last portion of this, because, you know, obviously my focus is largely economic justice. Uh -huh. And when Derek Hamilton came on here, he talked about baby bonds because what he felt like was vital to the African-American community and all poor people in general was eradicating the, the uh, variables for the lottery of birth. And so by giving people a bond to start with that would allow them to have money walking out the door, that they would, they would mature at some point, they, you know, be given to them based on, you know, the, whatever, there's certain parameters that they put out. I don't have all the details perfectly there. <clears throat> but what, what he talked about, we also talked about was reparations. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, reparations are, are, encompass a lot more than just money. And right. said, yes, absolutely. He said, but one of the most important things that any reparations would have to have is acknowledgement. And uh -huh. it's the acknowledgement that I think people struggle with more than the dang on money. It's like, <laughs> it's an indictment on their person. It's yes. an indictment on their existence. And so for whatever reason, they are unable to acknowledge the wrongs that have been committed in the United States to people of color, poor, you know, indigenous people, you name it. Uh, Talk to me well, about how we can help people, you know, help bring about this acknowledgement because it's vital to healing a nation. That acknowledgement of a wrong it, yes. it is so vital. How, how can we get there? Well, I think America must apologize to black and brown people and what how they've affected their lives generationally. And then you know, they can make all the promises they want to. We know how that, how far that goes. <laughs> 40 acres and a mule, we're still waiting for that. They promised the indigenous people, you know, and they went back on that promise as well. So I think acknowledgement is first. Uh, it's, it's strange that we, we were talking about Starbucks earlier. The CEO acknowledged the fact that a wrong had happened and he got in front of it. And so because he acknowledged that this wrong happened, it was able to move it forward in terms of the healing process. And so if the United States truly uh, want to begin to heal the process for the, the uh, uh, hardships that they've done to people of color in this, in this, in this country, 
Uh, it first starts with an acknowledgement, you know, a knowledge that uh, you had, you built this country off of the backs of slaves. You built this country off of back of people of color. And so, you know, and then we can get into reparations, but reparations doesn't necessarily have to mean just money. Right. Reparations can be land, reparations can be free medical, reparations can be a lot of things. <laughs> but before we can even try to scope that out, you know, you got an arrogant government that will never uh, acknowledge or never apologize to people of color because they feel that they never have to. And so while we wait for that long awaited apology that I believe will never come, it's up to us now to take care of ourselves. We need to make sure that we start preparing for generational wealth. Let's start businesses. Let's not be afraid uh, to start your own business. That can even help individuals in our family who are coming home from incarceration. Uh, that solves the problem in terms of employment when there's a family business to work at. Um, you know, it's, it's about taking care of oneself. It's about responsibility um, because we cannot no longer rely on this big hand of government uh, that doesn't even see us as human beings to take care of us or to take care of us properly. Uh, we should want to take care of ourselves. And it doesn't mean that we're saying we're superior to anyone else. I'm saying that you have children. Everything you do now, Stephen, is to provide for your children to make sure that they have a better life than you have. And so that's how we feel, you know, and I think that's how any gen uh, person or uh, a, a culture should feel. Um, it should always be a legacy that you're leaving, um, but black and brown people, and particularly black people, have not had a good, um, I should say, uh, scorecard <laughs> when it comes to building generational wealth. And I think now that you see, again, the tide is turning. Uh, we get it. Uh, we Instead of running out, making all the, everybody else rich, uh, we can do the exact same thing as well. It can start off, I've seen uh, families start off with a water ice stand on a corner. And, and now they have their own flavor and their own business. And it's in certain supermarkets. You know, don't be afraid to step out on faith. You know, um, we can do more than just come up with fancy dances for MTV to steal. So it's, <laughs> you know, we can do a lot of things. And, you know, and it's our, again, it's a responsibility uh, to make sure that we pass on what we've been taught. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we create a better life for our children so they can create a better life for their children. It's about personal responsibility. And I think you see that now, not only just with black and brown people, you see that with, you know, you see that now coming from uh, uh, cultures and, 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 and races that have never truly practiced that and, uh, and follow through with it. And so I'm happy about that, you know, and all that comes from imagery, how you view yourself. How do you believe in yourself? Do you think you're smart enough to do these things? You know, if you've been oppressed so long and feel that you can't put two to two together, you can run a business. I've seen single black mothers turn a dollar into 15 cents. <laughs> OK, if you can take care of a household full of black men, you damn sure can go out there and build business. <laughs> That's right. You know, it's it, you, you just said something really, really powerful. And and I and I, I want to really hone in on this for a second. When we abuse people in general, yes. and you can see this in your own home, uh, you have a father that was abusive, you have a grandfather, a grandmother that was abusive, whatever, a brother that was abusive. You can see that people start to either fight back or accept the negative image. And you can see that in high school as well, you, the way the kids are to each other. You know, yes. I have a son who has a special needs. And, you know, I think to myself, oh my God, he's not going to be able to fight back. Mm -hmm. I worry about this. But you take it to the next level. And, and you know, it's easy to say a special needs kid's going to get picked on because that's what people do. And I, and I hate when people say kids will be kids. Mm -hmm. I want to see parents do better. But you're yes. telling me something even broader than that. <clears throat> an entire culture, an entire community has had that exact experience of, of being made feel less than, 
Uh-huh. And then some people have overcome that and said, no, nah, hell no, I'm not going to start. I'm, I'm good, man. I'm going to make shit happen. But That's right. Living in that eyes down at the ground, kicking rocks, not sure they can do anything, not uh-huh. thinking they can do anything. And then they don't do anything. And then they prove the bad people. They prove it right. Right. Because uh-huh. they're so beaten down. Uh-huh. I, I hate that. But talk to me a little bit about overcoming that help. Help us see how people can take the time to, to how, how, how they can process themselves out of stinking thinking, as I call it. Well, first is the mindset, because you can't do anything unless your mind is clear. It's a spiritual component. You must have mind, body and spirit connected. I think you see it now. You know, you see the way um, you view yourself. Uh, the negative stereotypes have always portrayed black, brown people as, you know, less than. But I think the imagery now that we are responsible for how we view ourselves and we are responsible how we teach our children how they view themselves. We cannot allow television to raise our children uh, because they will never show them as, you know, the kings and queens that they are. But you see that now. And it's not. I think a lot of black people, especially in the church, felt that, you know, speaking about black pride and speaking about uh, black acceptance was some sort of radical uh, view that you have to put down another race. You don't have to put down another race to say that I'm black and beautiful. You know, (laughs) I would hope that you would look in the mirror and think that you could be beautiful as well. But I think now that we are taking the responsibility as black and brown people to make sure that we are educating our children, to make sure that we are instilling in our children a love of self and a love of pride. Uh, and, and, And you see that, you know, to put it's a seed that you plant. Like any flower that blooms, it starts with a seed and it starts with watering that seed and taking care of it as it blooms. And I think we are planting seeds now. And you see um, that even someone of color can be a president of the United States. You know, the the image that we see are extremely important. And our children are going to grow up knowing that there was a black president, (laughs) you know, and actually live through that. Uh, So all those things are good. You know, all those things are good, regardless of, you know, what scorecard you may have given President Obama. (laughs) Thank you. But, uh, yeah, because I got a few, yeah, uh, we'll talk about that later, but, you know, maybe next time. (laughs) But but the point was, it was important. I'll hit this for just one second, and you can correct that point, because I don't want to lose it. Yeah. There's a huge difference between... Obama being a good president or a bad president Uh and being a representative of a group of people that never thought they'd see a president that looked like them. And I think it's really important for people to understand this. We don't, I don't feel any particular disgust or pride one way or the other about the last 40,000 white presidents. (laughs) I don't feel like, well, okay. So that white president, George W. Bush sucked. So God bless, I've got to keep my head down as a white man. And I didn't feel like that with Reagan, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, is that you have one black president and people tried in a subversive way to say he bombed the hell out of seven countries. He did this, he did that. See, there's a black president. And they did all this stuff and it was so subversive. So why they missed the point. I know I am not an Obama fan at all. But I am very much a fan of the fact that what he did was open the door for people to dream and believe that they belong. Well, there's two, there's two discussions that we can have. First is the image of someone who was a person of color who didn't have a, a thousand baby mamas, who didn't, <laughs> who didn't fit the stereotype, the negative stereotypes when you think of a black man. So it was important. I think he understood how important it was. Uh, you know, how he conducted himself. And I think he wanted to do that. He was proud the fact that he was a black man who married the baby's mother. Uh, he was proud the fact that he wasn't an absentee father. He was proud the fact that, you know, this was his family and it wasn't uh, all for make-believe. This is what he was and who he was and who he is. 
Um, so that's the image part. And yes, that was extremely inspiring, you know, especially for me and for other generations to come. Um, the policy, you know, that's something to be criticized. And we can criticize him because he is he was the president of the United States. And that's what we do when we deal with presidents. So, you know, I think a lot of people got caught up in the fe- in the image of it that, oh, we cannot criticize a black president. No, we can criticize the president of the United States. And when they F up, then we need to call them on their crap. <laughs> and I don't care what color they were. There were a lot of things that he did that I was proud of. And there are a lot of things that I wasn't proud of. And I wasn't afraid, you know, I wasn't going to turn into a pillow of salt because I condemned Barack Obama <laughs> on some policies that I didn't agree with. So, you know, and I, you know, and so I wasn't invited back to a lot of tables, <laughs> but, but that's what he is. I mean, he's the president. Like I would, I would hold any politician and black or white. I don't care what color they are, what religion they are. I don't care if you're a politician, you work for the people. It's not the other way around. People don't work for you. And so we have to call, we have to get past these symbolisms. Oh, we can't call a Hispanic, uh, you know, politician out because we're Hispanic. He's the first, he's the second, whatever it is. I don't care what color you are. If you are taking votes from the people and you make promises, we're going to hold you to those promises. And I don't care who you are. So no one is above it. But, you know, I do thank Barack Obama for walking that line uh, as a black man, as a man of color with his black wife and his black children. And so, you know, it was important for us to see that. um, And it was important for us to embrace that. Uh, But that's image. When we talk about policies, he's just like any other politician. He can get it too. (laughs) It's it's great that you say this because I, you know, coming from an alcoholic background right uh-huh. you know a lot of times people will try and say things that will like curb the 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 insult or add to the insult or whatever based on this yes. and, you say, and you say to yourself well wait a minute hold on i need to be held accountable i can't if you if you don't i'm not going to be normal i'm not going to be ethan i'm not going to be equal and you yes. treat me like i got you know like one leg here treat me like a human being treat uh-huh. me like a freaking human being if i fail talk to me about it. if i succeed talk to me about it Treat me based on my merit. And yes. I think that what you're saying is really, really speaking to me here. And that is, is that there, there are two conversations to be had. There's the aesthetic, there's the impact, the emotional impact, the, the visual impact. And then there is the, hey, you're president, yeah. dude. Do your job. Yeah, and exactly. so, I mean, it, you can have both. You, you, you're not monolithic. You don't have to sit there and it's not either or. It's both. And I think that's a very, very powerful, powerful statement that allows people to both embrace the fact that we made history and at the same time critique based on the fact that he's not a black president. He is just president. Exactly. <laughs> like, like, like the, like the Nazi that we have in pres- in the office now. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta call it for what it is. You know, they, oh, he's a Republican. No, he's a Nazi. And a racist bigot. <laughs> now we can have a conversation. <laughs> we, we started it on facts and truth. You got a Nazi. You you nominated, you voted a Nazi in, and now you're going to pay for it because <laughs> he because this man is the Antichrist. If I ever saw one. <laughs> All right. Well, look, we're over time. What I want to do, I want to give you an opportunity to tell what's coming up, things you got yes. going on, and and before I do that, I want to say. Asa, it has been a pleasure to have you on. I look Thank forward you. to working with you in the future. I yes. really, really like what you bring to the table. And I, I'm so grateful to have this connection. I can't thank you enough thank you. Uh, for agreeing to do this. So with that, I'll let you take us out. Tell us what we got in store coming up. What's, what's yes. happening with Asa? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Stephen. It's been a long time. I know we've been trying to get this done. And I look forward to future conversations as well. So thank you for inviting me on. Uh, you know, on your platform. I truly appreciate that. Um, Also, what we have is, of course, we are the Coalition for Black Lives. We have our Facebook page and you can inbox us and we do uh, respond. Uh, Ursula, uh, we call her Ursula X. She's in charge of the page, so she'll make sure we 
you get a, a, a response, a quick response. Of course, you can uh, hit me up on uh, Asa Khalif on my Twitter page, Asa Khalif on Facebook and so Instagram, social media. Uh, we have Food Fest that's coming up in May, and I will um, post all the information uh, coming uh, the free, uh, probably in next week or whatever. But that's where we're actually going into um, a certain area that truly needs it in Kensington. Uh, they call it Tent City. City. And so we're going to be there to make sure for that uh, whole day that from beginning to, uh, morning to night that we are feeding uh, homeless individuals who are there. And we're calling it the Food Fest. We have wonderful sponsors behind us so far, and I'm very excited about it. And we need to send a message to City Hall that you cannot forget about your homeless in this city. You cannot. While you're meeting with all these executives and stuff, come down to Tent City in Kensington and meet with those individuals and help them lift them above their troubles. Uh, we have future protests coming up, which I can't say. I have to play it close to the vest. <laughs> but we are um, planning on to challenge one particular college that is definitely not dealing with their black and brown students in the proper way. And we're working with the students at that. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, of course, you know, I'm also a filmmaker as well. Um, they can also look at um, my film called America Black that was um, in 2016. It documents my um, cousin, Brandon Tate Brown, who was murdered uh, December 15, 2014 by uh, police officers in the 15th district. And uh, we're still rallying for him, justice for Brandon Tate Brown. We're still on top of the uh, David Jones case. Um, as you know, we went to the police officer's home um, along with other activists. So we are still waiting for that office, former officer to be uh, charged. He was officially fired. So continue to keep the Jones family in your prayers. And, um, and Dennis Plowdy Jr., the last latest young man of color who was shot by police officers. Uh, we want to monitor that uh, case as well. That's still under investigation. So please keep the families of the victims of police violence in your prayers. And uh, again, you know, stay tuned for uh, information that we have. Uh, we update our page daily and put, continue to keep the activists in the Black Lives Matter movement in your prayers. Keep me in your prayers because we certainly need it. We're putting our bodies on the line and, you know, it's, it's, a thankless job, <laughs> but um, the reward is so wonderful because we're helping people not only in our community, but we're educating people outside of the community as well. So the fight continues. Black Lives Matter, pass uh, power to the people. The people united will never be defeated and don't ever allow fear to stop you from organizing. If you are sincere about it, you're passionate about it, use that passion to get in the streets, off the sidewalks, into the streets, and make a change. The people will make the change if we stand united together. That is fantastic. What a great closing. With that, I want to thank you, Asa. You have an open platform. I look forward to us trying to find a way to get these events broadcast on Real Progressives. And more importantly, I look forward to talking to you offline so I can up my game as well. So I appreciate further, it. Thank you so much for your time. You will be back anytime you want, and I'm going to pursue you like crazy, man, because I really <laughs> want to get on with this, man. So without thank further you. ado, thank you all very much. Have a great week ahead. We will talk to you all soon. Thank you again, Asa. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. You got it. Have a great day, everyone.